And we have in the studio Fifi Kwete. And Fifi Kwete is uh, here to give us a lot more um, on his own take about the content of the President's State of the Nation address. A very good morning to you, a Member of Parliament for Kitsu South. Good morning. Good morning, to good morning to you and mm. to all your I, many viewers as well. Yeah, definitely. And you were in the house yesterday. Mm -hmm. I would want to ask you what your initial reactions to the President's State of the Nation address and many of the contents as well. Uh, first of all, in terms of the uh, broad delivery, um, I think it's always the case that when you have a former member of parliament uh, who is now president, there is a certain, uh, uh, shall I call it, banter, camaraderie, which is nice. Uh, I think we used to have the same thing also with the former president, uh, uh, John Dramani Mahama, and now with President Akufuado. So to that extent, I think uh, there is a certain feel, former member of parliament, uh, current members of parliament. So there is a certain uh, camaraderie, which is beautiful. Uh, in terms of the content, uh, I think there is a need for us to start moving away from uh, the campaign and start realizing that now there's governance. Uh, so somehow the discourse needs to be a little more uh, comprehensive rather than uh, a bit partisan. I think uh, there was a bit of partisanship, uh, which I understand. Uh, having run a campaign, a tough campaign as that, uh, you can't easily just make that transition quickly. But I think the president needs to get there, uh, especially when you are presenting the state of the nation. Obviously, you are presenting liabilities, but you also must present the assets. Uh, it can't simply just be a uh, balance sheet that has only negatives. It clearly has positives. But the president conveniently chose to uh, forget about the positives and just emphasize the negatives. Uh, I would say this being the first state of the nation by him, uh, we can excuse that. Uh, mm. But I'm hoping that it quickly transi transitions out of it. Yeah, because uh, uh, I was just about to raise, uh, if before the last president, uh, John Dramani Mahama exited. There was a summary State of the Nation address, and sure. that almost uh, a bit on the opposite end, if you look at the content of um, that of President Nanado Danko Kufado. Uh, I think that was more comprehensive, because I mean, what the former president did was to say, these are the difficulties. Mm -hmm. We have difficulties in terms of uh, budget uh, deficit, and then explain why those difficulties occurred. We had this issue relating to debt, this is why it's okay. That's far more comprehensive as opposed to this situation where you conveniently talk about debt, you don't talk about infrastructure. So it's a bit too, too selective and too uh, one, one sided. Uh, a, a, a critical point that he raised was that uh, we as a country did not meet any of the conditions under the IMF over the last period of the year. Uh, then again, I think uh, the discourse must change again. I mean, because you know, it sounds almost as if you don't have an economy of your own, <laughs> and the, uh, the economy is like, I mean, we have a, as a country we determine targets, and of course those targets. Once you're in a program with a fund, those targets are discussed with the fund. So let's say we miss our target. This situation about you miss IMF target makes you look as if you don't have an economy on your own that you're running. But then again. Uh, I think the president was a little selective there again. I mean, for example, when the president creates the impression as though uh, everything about the economy last year was negative, he conveniently uh, f forgot to tell the country that last year the economy uh, saw uh, uh, what you call the reserves that absolutely unprecedented in our history. As at some time around uh, September, the reserves were about 5.4 billion dollars which i really never been and i'm sure it actually ended even stronger than that talk about that obviously they didn't want to and that clearly will be something the imf will be will be happy with the imf clearly will be happy with the fact that uh, the depreciation of the currency last year was absolutely moderate i mean the city depreciated uh, less than seven percent i mean the whole of last year if you compare what happened in the year 2008 when uh, Nana Kufuadu then as a uh, candidate uh, uh, and his government were exiting. We're talking about over 20% <coughs> depreciation on the currency. It's followed by another 18% depreciation. And even then they had to uh, have that only because they were desperate and sold stuff like Ghana Telecom to survive. So you must look at it in broad perspective in order to give the country a full picture. Now, he also obviously didn't want to talk about the fact that inflation had actually been on the way down consistently. Uh, and that's decreasing inflation has continued even into January and even February. I mean, this February, I'm sure we'll see the same thing. So you can see a bit too selective. 
Okay, he clearly talks about maybe difficulty with deficit, uh, budget deficit, and uh, okay, that's all IMF is about. But IMF <coughs> is not all just about deficit. IMF also, uh, shall I call it, uh, dynamic enough to even understand why sometimes you can miss set certain targets. Last year, it was obvious that uh, if you had a situation where your FPSO develops a major fault, therefore the oil liftings are definitely going to be markedly lower. <laughs> That's definitely going to affect your revenue. IMF knows that. An election year, you have an election to run, and I'm not saying using the money to win election. I'm talking about the election itself in terms of money that you have to spend, not just the Electoral Commission, if they go beyond the normal uh, uh, range, money that you're going to give for the peace of the country and so on. So those things naturally cause difficulty. So uh, one can understand why some of the, the revenue shortfalls happen and why there's a little overrun in terms of the budget. But if uh, the president wanted to truly become the, he would have told the country that clearly this situation in 2017 it's a far better situation than 2009. Well, well truly, though, but in all truism, uh, the former president, John Romani Mahama, had promised Ghanaians that the overruns would not be at uh, percentage levels at which, uh, of course, the ordinary man on the street should be worried about uh, for the next fiscal year. Uh, but, but we still saw that there were expenditures uh, beyond what had been projected for. And that's what the president tried to say. Yeah, but then the thing is, is um, you, don't, you don't isolate overruns as if overruns on their own uh, uh, is all the country is about. Then you must be looking at the effects of those overruns. And I just give you the fact. Now, if the overruns were debilitating as somebody who wanted to know, well, how come inflation is consistently trending down? How come the CD was able to keep the level uh, of stability that it did? Mm. How come we, I mean, the World Bank, the IMF, the financial markets, the rating agencies, all are unanimous that Ghana had in 2016 a foundation that is going to bring about a growth in 2017 of in the region of about 7 to 8 percent. So obviously, it's not just about uh, 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 mentioning one or two. Uh, target and say you miss it, therefore it's a Magadon. Clearly it's not a Magadon. Mm. If it were a Magadon, then we should not be having these uh, substantially better uh, uh, real situation as far as some of these important indicators are concerned. I mean, so that's what I'm saying. You must have a comprehensive view of, of the issue. And as the president, uh, I do anticipate, I do hope that he would. I think generally, listen, after how many? Over two decades of partisanship, we need to be moving into that position where we can talk about a country without necessarily wanting to scope capital. Political capital is not necessarily, uh, I can understand during campaign period, but once you are off the campaign mode, we should talk nation, we should bring issues that clearly the people will be able to make an analysis and then leave the people to make their judgment. I believe if you do that, at the end of the day, the people are discerning enough to know, listen, these guys, have managed better than these people, instead of wanting to constantly skew as if people don't have the capacity to make the discernment, I think that really should, should be a thing of the past. Mm. But for all the things that we have to say, over the last year and uh, three years before then, a number of projects had been undertaken which uh, would impact positively on the economy, which you thought the president should have highlighted. Which were some of them that you thought the president could have also highlighted? and not only the negatives. You know, normally, um, when you hear the president yesterday uh, creating this whole uh, scenario that the country is so highly indebted and that the debt to, to, to GDP ratio is really, really, really unsustainable, I kind of find it interesting. Uh, because the conversation must be moving away from just the quantum of debt. I think we read that moment where you should be talking what actually is the efficiency of the loans, what is the utilization of the debt. And when you feel there is a question mark about the utilization, then you have a conversation. For example, if you mention that, okay, there is $1 billion that was uh, uh, contracted, and you spend that $1 billion in building the gas infrastructure, and every financial uh, 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 feasibility shows that within a matter of five years, that, that gas infrastructure is able to recoup the complete costs and then also contribute massively to the energy generation of the country and therefore becomes a
clear foundation for a lot of acceleration in economic growth and also job creation. That's no debt. That's an investment. And the country must celebrate that investment. The same way the country celebrated the investment that brought about uh, the Akosombo Dam, which actually has played a pivotal role as far as the country's economic transformation is concerned. If you talk about $400 million that was uh, obtained as loan, and you can point to the Pong water expansion project, which delivered water to communities in Ghana, in Accra, that over 25 years have never had potable water. That is not a debt. That is an investment. And I'm saying that is the, the what I call the forward-looking conversation that we should be engaging in. Oftentimes, when I'm just having conversation with people who are just doing normal politicking, I understand. Because oftentimes, they may not always be apprised I mean, with what I call the finer details of the economics and so on. But when you're talking to people who should know better, you're talking to people who are supposed to be seasoned economists, you're talking about people like, <coughs> let's say, the current vice president, Baumia, or even President Akufuado, who obviously have had a background in economics, and they still talk as if people who don't understand the finer details of economy, I get very worried. I'm saying the conversation should be moving away from debt and must be going more into the utilization of debt. Because all these massive investments that have been made are critical for the acceleration of our economy, are critical for the transformation of our economy, are going to help to deliver prosperity and job for the people of Ghana. I mean, because really, what is this whole business of governance about? It's about creating conditions that can bring about change and transformation. And that is a critical investment. So we're talking about a, a government that has left behind unprecedented uh, 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 infrastructure, not just social infrastructure, but also economic infrastructure. You understand? And also not beyond that, we've left behind, I'm just hoping that they'll be able to continue a sinking fund which actually enables MPP today to be able to take care of some of the, uh, for example, the 2007 uh, euro bond uh, 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 money that the MPP contracted during their time, we left a sinking fund that actually made provision in order for them to be able to take care of it this year. Mm. They should actually be showing some gratitude. But obviously, the president in his anxiety to continue scoring political points, forgetting the elections are over, therefore governors must be here. It's too busy just creating negativity. I think they should acknowledge that. They should acknowledge, for example, we set up an infrastructure fund, which is going to be important for the country. That's, of course, if they do not uh, mortgage uh, that accelerated infrastructure by continuing what I'm calling uh, worrying, worrying trends of wanting to cater for the consumption rather than investment. And that takes us into some of the shall I call it, unfortunate um, things I'm hearing about wanting to take precious oil resource, <laughs> using it to pay school uh, Finance, for, OK, we'll see. We'll come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, as far as social interventions are concerned, uh, for policies like having a full implementation of free senior high school education uh, and the other I incentives, uh, definitely you need to free up the fiscal space so that then you can have a lot more whether it's by way of internally generated revenue or perhaps also making sure that you have enough space to go borrow because then you, you'll be in a position to pay back. And if the president is rightly worried due to the level of debt burden, that's understandable, is that not it? Because he's Actually, made promises, and as a politician and as a president, he also needs to make sure that he fulfills his promises. Mm. Actually, on that score, I think really the president should actually be a bit grateful. The president should be grateful because if the president, I mean, it takes time to even uh, investigate what the situation was even at the beginning of the, the tenure of President Mahama, and I'm talking about in, uh, in, in 2013, what the president is saying, uh, uh, three budget items are consuming 99%. In 2013, mm. those three budget items were consuming a region of 120%. It was worse. It was worse. Now, it takes a government uh, uh, that is determined to do what you got to do to take the decisions in order to be able to bring that down. So bringing it down to 99%, the president should actually be grateful. But he's actually creating an impression that this is the end of the world. Mr. President, no, it's not the end of the world at all. This is a much better situation. Now, what brought about that whole, uh, shall I call it, uh, phenomenal, phenomenal situation? It came about because of the single spine. Because the single spine, at the very beginning of it, uh, if you took the public sector wage, you added the other, uh, what you call, uh, um, uh, items that make up what you call compensation. 
and then you took the arrears that actually we had owed, I mean, the workers of Ghana. If you put them together, those alone were consuming over 92, 93% of the public revenue, uh, public, uh, uh, I mean, uh, how do you call it, uh, the government revenue. Now, that alone was taking 92. Now, before you come and talk about interest payment, by the time you talk about interest payment, you've gone over 100. Before you now come and talk about this is assembly, common fund, get fund, national health insurance, that took you in the region of a 120. And we dealt with that. Those were the reasons why the borrowing started. Because when you are constrained so massively, you have no option because the country still needed to run. So you were compelled now to start doing what you call domestic borrowing. So the president is meeting at least a situation where those major items are, are, are just about 99%. So you should actually be grateful to the NDC. Oh, well, so we'll be having into the, uh, into the, we'll be inviting into the discussion uh, Anthony Cabo. He's a member of parliament for Laura. But before we do all that, though, uh, my colleague uh, Maxwell Agbagba is on the streets asking Ghanaians uh, what they think about the content of the President's State of the Nation address out from um, some of these students what they make of the president's address yesterday whether they think is reassuring I want to find out from them their own opinion on the state of the nation um, address as delivered by president of um, uh, yesterday chief what's your name i'm evans Naraka from Pond, Owari. okay evans tell me yesterday you listened to the state of the nation address what's your own you know opinion about the address yesterday? I think yesterday I had the privilege to sit down and monitor the whole state of the nation address from the beginning to the end of the program. I wasn't much assured by the president that the change Ghanaian voted for is the change he is bringing on board because it, it seems he was just basing on his policies, policies that he used in campaigning to be president was what he was talking about earlier in the parliament. I think it got to a point when the president was talking about free education. I realized the education minister in parliament and the senior minister who is supposed to report to the president was even sleeping in parliament. Mm -hmm. The president has been in the chambers for 12 years and now he's back to the chamber as the president of the country. So he should know what Ghanaians actually goes, like what actually ha is happening to Ghanaians. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to talk about those things to touch a lot of Ghanaians their hearts. Mm -hmm. But he was just talking about the policies he so, spoke about so during his campaign era. That was what he was repeating at the parliament. So you think basically the whole statement was uh, was a rehash of the campaign promises? That's what that, that was what he was talking about. Wow. Interesting. Now, uh, uh, tied to what um, Evans is saying, is also the issue of, um, you know, the source of funding for the free SHS. You know, yesterday the President of Kufuadu says, yes, um, the free SHS is going to, you know, be rolled out in the 2017-2018 academic year. But a lot of people were disappointed because he did not state the source of funding for, you know, the free SHS. There was a lot of talk about, you know, using the Heritage Fund. Were you disappointed when you didn't hear where the funding source, what the funding source would be? I wasn't really disappointed. If he didn't mention the source of funding, that's not a problem. The problem here is if he is going to do it for us. If he is going to bring free SHS for our students, then I think that's okay. It doesn't really matter where he's going to get the money from. Just he bringing it is enough for us. Okay. Interesting. There's an argument about, you know, a wholesale approach towards, you know, towards this, making it free across broad. There are some people who think that, uh, you know, some parents can actually afford the cost of, you know, fees for the awards. So we do not necessarily have to, government does not necessarily have to bear that cost. We need to identify vulnerable people and pay those fees for them. What do you think about the whole idea of providing free education for all SHS students? Well, for me, it's really a good initiative because mm. looking at the number of street children or um, the less privileged in the country, it's wider than um, the rich. Okay. Yes, yeah, so if he's bringing it on board, I think it's a very good um, standpoint. Okay. Uh, Maxwell Agbagba giving us uh, those insights into what the views of ordinary students or young people are about the present state of the nation address and some of his policy intentions. And Anthony Cabo is also joining the conversation. He's a member of parliament for Laura. Basu, how are you? Very well. Okay. Very so, well. And, and I know that you, you have um, perhaps great insight into some of the things that the president said. And, and straight away, how would you describe his speech in the first place? 
Well, um, first of all, let me say good morning to your cherished viewers and to my constituents in Laura as well. And I think that His Excellency the President was, 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 was very upfront. Indeed, he was a um, well-prepared speech that virtually captured the current state of our country and the direction in which we have to go mm -hmm. to ensure that the commitments that he has made to the Ghanaian people will be met within the space of his mandate. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, I thought it was a very good speech. He sought to lay the basis for which the country's economic takeoff will, 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 will be hinged on. And the fact that the reality that um, our, is our, our, our worst fears have been confirmed, which is to say that what we thought the state of the economy was before coming into government, Indeed, it has become even more serious. It's a dire situation that the country finds itself in. And the president was quite clear that he is not going to be in the business of lamentation, but rather he's going to, you know, get himself together, get his government together, and begin to address the issues one by one. But it's important that we establish that indeed we didn't take over a healthy economy, we didn't take over. Uh, a country's finances that have been in good shape. There's a huge financial... But Tony, all, all your critics say that the president was all negative. Was all negative, uh, well, forgetting I mean, that within the period, for all the concerns that he has uh, and his advisors also have about borrowing, etc., uh, they were used to do things for the economy and, uh, and for the Ghanaian people. I mean, nobody has said borrowing in itself is a bad thing. I don't think anybody has said that. Even if you look in all the economic literature, they'll tell you borrowing is not a bad thing. It is what is being used for. The same IMF in their own report have indicated that a lot of the borrowing that has been done under this gov under the under previous government has gone into consumption. Those are not productive sectors of the economy. Those do not certainly ensure that uh, you know there is human impact, and for that matter, you know people are going to benefit in, in, in that respect. But of course, if a country borrows so much and tries to borrow its way out of debt, mm -hmm. then that becomes a problem in terms of you know, microeconomic uh, uh, analysis. And the president was quite clear about, if you talk about the arrears that are outstanding, of course, those are debts, but of course they are arrears as well. You understand? And these will show on the government books. The president talked about the fact that the IMF, you know, and the IMF program itself, many of the targets have been missed. He talked about the shortfalls in our revenue and, and, and the fact that you know, there's a, a, a huge budget deficit. Deficit targets that were set by the IMF have been missed by the government. The country's debt stock, as it stands now, is some 74% of GDP, you know. And, 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 and look, Roland, all these issues must be discussed. We can't continue to say that, oh, you're a government, you came into office, you don't complain. I mean, what, what are we complaining for? We're complaining because this is the situation. And we have to let the Ghanaian people know what their situation is so the president can, can move along with the country in a certain direction. Over the last um, period of, of the last government, uh, we, we had consistently an energy crisis which they had to grapple with and ultimately resolved um, in, for, for the better part of the year. And uh, following within that period, they had to make sure they took stringent measures, signing various Inipana, uh, power purchasing agreements with various IPPs, etc. The president comes in a State of the Nation address uh, and says that those would have to be reviewed as, as if the significant steps taken by the NDC government were just uh, for, for not. I mean, how can you sign 42 power pack agreements and about 20 still in the pipeline? Why not? I mean... Look, the issue, and this is the point, this is the prognosis we have given to the Ghanaian people, that the issue about the country's energy crisis is not an issue of generation. It's not an issue of installed capacity. It's a financial issue. And until we resolve the financial issues, all these power park agreements that we keep Which signing, to you is the state of the economy? Uh, in fact, and it's, a, it's a financial matter. And so all these power park agreements that we continue to sign will not materialize if the country's economy is not in a good shape, if we do not have the money, if the, if the energy ministry... Look, as we speak, <laughs> the debt in the energy ministry is huge. 
than the energy sector. The, the energy sector is huge. Well, we're told the president says 2.5 and billion. 2.5 billion dollars. And we're talking about, you know, some 20% of that or so, which is owed to local banks, about $800 million. But for a country as big as Ghana, it shouldn't uh, be anything of a worry. But I think that should worry any, any, any serious analyst. Anybody who is listening or anybody who is analyzing our energy sector will know that we are in a dire state. And we cannot continue, especially when the cost of electricity is even out of the reach of the ordinary person. Compa compare, you know, the kilowatt per unit that we, sell, we generate and sell here to our neighboring countries, and you'll find out that we are in a very serious situation. Mm. That but is affecting businesses. But our neighboring countries are not Ghana. Because sometimes some of the benchmarks that are used to measure or... No, but they are, the same, they are probably the same companies. I mean, many of the companies that are doing power... They are very much related. Here, I mean, they're the same things. They are okay. using the same materials. Mm. They're using the same crude. They are generating power. And they are selling. So the question is, why do we have this huge disparity? And those are the issues that the president sought to put out there. I was very excited when the president talked about the environment. I mean, we hardly hear a State of the Nation's address when the president veers into talking about the environment and the fact that, you know, climate change and adaptation policies are affecting, you know, farm inputs and farm, I mean, uh, farm outputs, especially in our rural, in the, in the countryside. And the fact that we must do a lot, you know, to grapple with the problem of, um, uh, 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 you know, the environment being degraded. In, in, in the, in and management. we know that Galamse is a very big issue. Beyond the, the, even beyond the felling the of timber even, in some Exactly. Of beyond the Galamse, we're talking about the felling of the rosewood in the three mm -hmm. northern regions mm -hmm. and the savannah ecological area and the fact that the lack of water is affecting agriculture, it's affecting so much, so many things. Well, These are quite important issues okay. the president raised. But, but Fifi, we, we know that energy provision is at the heart of uh, industry. And um, for what plagued us over the last four years, of course, we've had some relief over the last couple of, uh, over the last year, I mean, ultimately. Uh, we, we should say that having a debt burden of over two billion is, uh, is, is, is something that any government will be worried about. Yeah, that's true. Um, but you see, we need to have always um, a comprehensive analysis of situations. Uh, I've said it again that uh, one of the difficulties I see sometimes in our country is that we tend sometimes to be a little too superficial when we are uh, analyzing issues. And that doesn't help in terms of finding solutions. The question is this, what brings about the debt in the energy sector? The debt in the energy sector is brought about because governments upon governments have tried very hard to cushion the ordinary people from paying the real costs for power. So for example, if it costs you, let's say, uh, 20 uh, cents to produce, the ordinary people are saying, you know what, we cannot pay the 20 cents. So government and MPP did it, NDC did it in the past, MPP did it, NDC came and did it again. And after a while we say, no, if we continue on at this level, we will destroy the whole energy sector. So the debt came about because government was trying very hard to cushion the ordinary people from paying that full cost. Really? That's exactly what brought about the debt. What do you think brought about the debt? So for example, VRA imports crude oil at a certain cost. A VRA has to sell the power to ECG at a much lower cost because government cannot allow them to sell it at that full cost because 200 people cannot. So government now promises VRA, they you know what, we will actually try to get money in order to pay you. That's how the debt starts to accrue. Now, so when you, after how many, 24 years in power, having had opportunity and to pay eight years in power, Obviously, the discourse must be different. But when you continue to mount in political platform, just going on the, I mean, the plane to the gallery, creating impression that somehow you have the capacity to be able to make what you call electricity prices much cheaper, when you know you cannot, because there's no way you are So that is why you want the conversation to be mainstream, to be realistic. Absolutely. That's the only way. You see, we must reach that moment where you talk country rather than talk parties. So ideally, it should be what? 
The truth. We should, be ma we should be making if, if consumers can, pay for. If you can, if you can allow me to, 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 to make progress, I'm sure the people will understand me clearly. The point I'm making is this. That when, for example, the MPP on the campaign platform, we're talking about we're going to remove energy uh, sector levy. We're going to remove energy sector levy. They obviously didn't know what they were talking about. The reason why the energy sector levies were brought was to be able to raise money in order to find ways in which you can defray this debt that was strangulating not just the power sector. Which is still even strangulating us. Yeah, but the truth is that with the energy sector levy, we were able to move into a conversation with the banks in order to have a plan that would amortize that loan. We're able to make one huge bullet payment in order to have a structure that, listen, this debt can be, as it were, amortized over a period of years. That's how you do it. That's how you manage an economy. Now, having made the promises they made, that they were coming to remove, I mean, reduce this, remove that, remove that, now they come in the reality is hitting them in the face. I'm saying going forward, this tendency to want to uh, create an impression that you have the capacity to turn everything into what you call a, a garden of Eden as soon as you come to power, which is the tendency most politicians have, must give way and have the capacity to tell a bit more of what the reality is. Tell also, the Ghanaian people. Exactly, tell the truth. <laughs> to the that people. you have to pay for what you consume. Because the truth is, you see, if we continue running away from what we ought to do, like it is said, he who fights and runs away is only leaving to fight a harder fight tomorrow. <laughs> so it's better to tell the truth to the people. You're only postponing that's your why, sorrows. That's why we had <laughs> okay. the courage to take away subsidies. Because taking away the subsidy means we're saying, listen, let's not continue burying our head in the sand. We need to be able to pay realistic prices. Because that's the only way you can sustain the sector in order to create opportunity for the future. Uh, 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 Anthony, let's move to education. Now, we know that prior to now, two weeks before his State of the Nation address, the president uh, had spoken about line items that, of course, will be free for... Uh, parents who have uh, or would be having their awards in senior high schools and and the, and the concern had been where we're going to find that from of course we have to wait uh, in the next two weeks to find from the the finance minister when he presents his budget etc but it was a big deal a, a big issue that at least the president could have better elaborated on uh, about the state of education and, and the state of the nation in that regard. What do you think? And how we're going to find well, it? Well, I mean, Roland, point. before that, I think, let me just do a quick rebut on some of the things my good friend Fifi Quitty was talking about. You know, it's very interesting how the sounds change when you're on the other side. You know, I mean, and the fact that we have to have a reality of a discussion. I think he said that before. No, no, I'm saying I'm constantly making my been, point. I'm, I'm constantly making, being on that. I'm making my point. Anthony, I've always said that. I mean, but Fifi, I'm making mm. my point. Mm. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just interesting how, you know, we juxtapose situations. Today I'm on the other side, he's on the other side. And it's almost as if the discussion has changed. But, you know, there's, a, there's an issue of principle. This is a government, previous government, that claims to be social democrats with social tendencies and the masses of the people. And all of a sudden, we're coming to the reality of moving away from those social democratic credentials to a clearly profit-driven, realistic pricing kind of situation. How, how is that possible? I mean, that's what he's talking about now. It's about electricity and consumption. Yeah, but don't forget, don't forget that. I mean, the, the attitude that we've had as a nation in dealing with our energy institutions is the reason why we're in this crisis. As we speak, VRA, ECG, huge government debt because government institutions are not paying the cost of electricity. You recall, and if you will recall this quite well, that His Excellency President Mills had instructed government institutions to do something about paying off their bills with ECG. In that way, that frees up some money for ECG. Eight years, it never happened. It didn't happen. Well, some steps were taken, no, like, for example, making it, sure that they had their prepaid meetings. Happened. Prepaid meetings. So you go to some of it the... It, 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 it did happen. It, did uh, happen. It, it, it never happened. It, it did happen. It, did it happen. never happened. We've come into government. We've audited. We're all looking at all that. It did happen. We're looking at that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. ministries and departments and state institutions still owe ECG big money. But you see, I mean, so if we want to have an honest discussion about this, 
Let's not begin to pigeonhole one party and you were on a campaign platform. There are many things that UPP Kwete said during the campaign platforms and got into government and could never do. So many of it. So your point is what? So my, my point is that, that you make uh, let's, let's, let's extreme have... promises, and when you come into government, you can you can. I mean, if it, I mean, so, I mean, so, that's so the mount... point of his argument. No, that we so need so to move mount. away to the so next. So don't mount the moral high ground. Well, he feels that but we don't should mount... leave that in no, the no, past. No, no, but I'm saying, I'm saying, but don't mount the moral high ground mm -hmm. and try to create the impression that well, I am the miss, I am the guy trying to have this discussion, and these politicians said this on the platform, mm -hmm. and they are in government today, and they are tongue waggling. No, no, no. When you when you get into that space, you get somebody coming. Do you in. think that the Kufado led government yes. uh, is being realistic with some of the things that it's espousing? Like what? Oh, for example, uh, saying that because of debt, it means that we have to be realistic about it. Uh, whilst at the same time, we know that we may not be in a position to take off some of the taxes or perhaps the line items as far as the taxation in Look, energy is we, when concerned. We talk and so about, not free up when the space we, when we for talk the about, When we talk about change and why we ask the Ghanaian people to vote for change, we didn't mean that we're coming into government and within one month everything was going to change in this country. Change is not an event. It's a process. How long is it going to take? I'm saying that we have a mandate. Okay. We have an absolute mandate. It's a four-year mandate, actually. I'm, but that's what I'm saying. We have a mandate. And we are sticking to that mandate. And we're saying that within the four years of His Excellency the President's mandate, we will make some monumental changes to the country's Free economy. SHS. And Funding, free, education. I mean, for, for instance, I come from a village in my hometown. Which village? I mean, Laura, for instance. is In my hometown, school fees for children in Losek, Laura Secondary School, is 750 Ghana cities. You go to Hermosek Tech, and school fees for secondary school students is 650 Ghana cities. In that town, how many parents are going to afford that money for their wars to go to school? So when Akufuado says that we are going to bring free SHS to ensure parity in education, to ensure that we bridge the educational gap between the rural and the urban centers of our country, and also make sure that education becomes affordable to our people, education reaches our people irrespective of the status of your father or your family that you come from. I think that, look, all of us in this country must put our minds to it and support the government. And I'm cocksure in my mind because my colleagues on the other side, Fifi and his, and his, uh, and his uh, the NDC, were vigorously opposed to this idea until they introduced something they call progressive. That progressive education has become so expensive. And I'm quoting school fees from Laura under the progressive education that was implemented by their government. 750 Ghana cities school fees for students going to Losek. So when Akufuado says that my free education is going to be free, we're going to take away exam fees, we're going to take away um, computer lab fees, we're going to take away all these auxiliary charges that help build up the school fees to a point where those of us in the rural areas are unable to afford it. And they're asking of funding. Where are you going to get the money from? Where is the funding going to come from? A finance minister, I mean, a senior minister makes a suggestion and says that, well, I mean, some monies from the Heritage Fund could be used. And hell broke loose. The finance minister has come out to say that, no, there are various funding streams that are being looked at. Whatever the case is, the government is committed, particularly this president, is committed that every Ghanaian child is educated right from the basic level and terminates at the senior high school level and gets into tertiary or a, 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 you know, whatever level that you, you want to go to. I think that, for me, that commitment alone and the political will, the consistency of this policy from 2008 leaves lots to be desired. A president who is well determined, a president who is convinced that the only way, and well, the arguments could be made differently. I recall when the issue about using the Heritage Fund came up under President Mahama, when he was vice president, talked about the XTX deal. We took a principled position and said that no, we were against that. I heard what the NDCs and John Mahama said. Maybe Quentin, his friends defended the president on that matter to a point where the opposition was described in some baloney terms that of what sense does it make if there is money going to be sitting uh, somewhere. So your point is? 
My point really is that the president is committed to ensuring this. The finance minister will put out the details. The mm. president has indicated to the country that September 2017, 2018 academic year we will see Laura a full school, 750 will turn into... Well, I have to wait and see what the numbers come up to. Okay. Uh, and, and that should be a good thing. I think that you, even on the other side of the political divide, you embrace uh, free SHS education and indeed other incentives given to education. Uh, but your argument is uh, the funding should be made clear? Yeah, first and foremost, um, let me tell my good friend, uh, Anthony Cabo, that my discourse relating to the need for us to make a transition after more than two decades of partisanship, anybody who had listened to my discourse, even while I was minister, would know this is a position I've articulated. I've had a few people on the other side who absolutely have made shall I call it, uh, the same progressive movement as well. Somebody like uh, my good friend, Kweku Kwatsen, we shared those similar sentiments. That this, what I call uh, um, pettiness, <laughs> we must transition out of here. Or oh, within days, therefore, it justify what I'm doing. And please, I can understand that if you are doing so in your first eight years in power. You've had eight years in power. We've had 16 years in power. We clearly must be able to be able to discuss certain issues without finding justification as to why it, it should be done this way because it happened that way. It's I find it pettiness. So I'm asking you make that progressive movement as some of your colleagues are doing. That's the first one. Two, uh, talking about education. Yeah, it's a, it's a constitution of Ghana that says that as much as resources will allow, we should make sure that education is free. That is a constitutional requirement. It's not about NDC, it's not about NPP. But the constitution makes it clear that it must start first at the basic level. The basic education in Ghana is not free. Majority of people who are going to the basic school are paying. Because what the government or the state is contributing by way of capitation grant obviously does not constitute the full, what you call, the fees that our children have to pay at the basic level. Education is like a pyramid. You start from the base and you make sure the base is consolidated. That not just you're having quality, but you also you make that free. Then you move from there and move to the secondary level. That's what the debate has always been. So it's not about rushing to want to make secondary education free when the very base, where, for example, if you have 6 million Ghanaian children at the basic level, out of that, maximum maybe 1.2 progress to the secondary level. You want to make sure that opportunity is given to those 6 million that at any moment are at the basic level to have quality and as much as possible affordable education. Both sides have not been able to do that. Now, so to create the impression of, say, if you are going to solve the education problem by making secondary education free, when you have not dealt with the foundation, mm -hmm. itself is not very good to know. But two, if you, are one, if you want to talk about secondary education, you want to make it free, you need to at least be able to clarify for the country how you hope to do so. Now, when you, a, a, a discussion that you've been having since 2008, the first time uh, the MPP started talking about free education at the secondary level, so eight years of that discussion, and you are given an opportunity in power to tell us how, and the senior minister tells us that, oh, we are looking at the possibility of taking heritage funds. Well, he said it a possibility. You, it, it tell, yeah, but that tells you that clearly it's something that they've thought through. After eight years, you are looking at heritage fund to fund free education. It tells you that there's absolutely no real thorough discussion that has gone into that whole process. Of course, we are happy that uh, uh, another minister came and said, no, it's not heritage fund. That itself is quite alarming. After eight years, you are not clear exactly how you want to go. I would have wished for the president to have intimated a little yesterday what is going to happen. But having, ha has, having not said it, we are hoping that a further opportunity will be granted during the budget for us to hear. Now, you, you recall, as I told you earlier, that the president makes, makes uh, everybody to understand that 99.4 or so percent of the revenues of Ghana are incumbent by three main items, public sector wage, interest payment, and statutory payment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a situation where virtually, I mean, out of uh, every 100 cities available uh, for the country, 99 cities is gone, and you are bringing in a budget item that is going to be in the region of about a conservative estimate between 2 billion cities to 3 billion cities. And obviously, that's going to be more because the more you make it a free, the more you are going to increase the number that goes. That means it's going to go up and up and up. 
and you are looking at her whole. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how they're going to do that. I, I'm, I'm but you're saying, not against. I'm, you're, you're not against. No, no, no. You see what they've been given. They've been given the Monday, and the Monday gives them room to do what it is they want to implement. Mm -hmm. So it will be nice to see uh, how they go about it. Roland, we'll Roland, you, Roland, you know, I, I like the tongue waggling of my friend P.P. Quentin. Tongue. I mean, it's just shifting the goalpost okay. as and when. You see, he's talking about basic education being free. This was their argument in opposition to the free SHS when we, when we talked about it. That was one of their plank major arguments. That why do you make secondary education free when the basic education is not free and there's no quality at the basic level? Ask them. They've been in office for eight years. They've been in office to implement their so-called free education for four years. What is the state of basic education in this country? What investment have they done in basic education? I have close to about 5,000 children at the basic level, nursery level, primary level in the Laura district. And I can tell you, it is, it's, it's, it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster. And that disaster. will improve the next four years. I'm saying it's a complete disaster. And that will disaster. improve in the next Hold four years. Hold on, please. We're, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm rebutting a point. You know, mm -hmm. it's a complete disaster. Now they talk about a constitutional right. There's so many things in the constitution. But it takes a leader with a political will to say that I am prepared to take this thing from the constitution and make it work. Mm -hmm. I am prepared to take it from the constitution and find money for it. Okay? They talk about where are we getting money. These people were in government. And the government is about priorities. You get into office, it's about what you want to do as a government. They decided to prioritize judgment debts and found money, huge money, huge money in this country to invest in judgment debts. That is the priority of the government. They brought a budget to parliament. They had a line item to pay judgment debts, many of which were fraudulent and criminal and completely reckless. They found money to pay. So if we are coming and we say that, look, if you look at the myriad of issues before us, one of the critical issues which we are prepared to deal with, and the president has indicated that, that his, his passion on free education is so strong that it agonizes when he sees what is wrong with our education. And I'm saying that under my watch, I am prepared to find money. If I have to squeeze that money out of stone, I will do that because... And you're speaking for the president. I'm, I'm saying, I'm speaking, I'm speaking as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as a as a as a ruling government official. I mean, so... Anthony Cabo, my time is up. Well, then that's fine. All right, so Anthony Cabo <laughs> is a member of parliament for Laura, and he was in the studio with uh, Fifi Fianvi Kwete, member of parliament for Kitu Sound. The two of you, thank you for passing through. Uh, grateful that you were able to do that. And we know we'll bring you a lot more discussions following the State of the Nation address by the president, Dana Adudankwe Kufado, before parliament on Tuesday. But that'll be it for the show. Please get interactive on Facebook, Join News on TV is the name of the page, and we've linked it to our Twitter handle at Join News on TV, and you can always get a lot more regular programming on the channel throughout the rest of the day. We're, we're saying bye-bye to you. Join us same time tomorrow. We'll have a good time. Bye.